Thanks very much, Hande, and uh, thanks very much, as always, to the Asia House for hosting this and for being such a strong and consistent voice for Asian literature. Um, I also want to thank specifically uh, Cocaine Grants for the Arts. It's sort of ironic that they call Cocaine Grants for the Arts, given that this is a talk of drug trade. Um, but I, I assure you that the, the uh, coincidence is purely just that. Uh, it's spelled C-O-C-K-A-Y-N-E, not the other way around. So. Um, thanks very much for the generosity and for the support for this uh, series on Sin Cities. Um, I can't tell you how pleased I am to have uh, Miguel next to us to talk about this. Um, I think obviously, you know, the news over the past year, year and a half on the issues around the drug trade in the Philippines um, is something that um, has been very, very well covered in the media. But here's somebody who is both um, very, very cosmopolitan, international and global, as well as, as he'll describe, also, you know, very, very local. Um, and he comes from a political family as well, so the kind of range of insights that he has is difficult to sort of compress into a talk that would go for roughly an hour or so, but hopefully we'll be able to cover some of that. Um, then Miguel is somebody who, again, spent, I guess, through college, where you lived, grew up uh, and lived in the Philippines, and then uh, spent time at, at Columbia University in New York City, in Singapore, uh, in Australia, in Abu Dhabi, so Montreal, Montreal. Yeah. sometimes in Hong Kong a little bit. Hong Kong, yeah. Uh, so where, where are you missing? Have you been in Africa? Yeah, I have been to Africa, yeah. Okay, right. so, okay. There so, so there we go. So we have somebody who was amazingly traveled and has some um, very, very wide perspective, but also in the last year moved back to Manila, living in Manila. Uh, during the reign of uh, Rodrigo uh, Duterte. So, um, not somebody who just lives in the liberal elite section of the world in that bubble, but also um, tries to be a man of the people and uh, to understand really what's going on. So, my, my critics would say otherwise, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe he's too much of a man of the people, which is why he got critics <laughs> in the first place. Um, but no, I think, I think in terms of talking about this theme and about you know, why in the Philippines also there's been this you know, sudden lurch to the right, is something that I think we are all should be very, very pleased uh, to have him present. And um, maybe we'll leave a little more time for Q&A just because I think there's mm -hmm. a lot that we can discuss rather than just you guys hearing the two of us just babbling to each other and without a lot of feedback from the audience. So, Miguel, so uh, first of all, I wanted to ask you, um, and also, I mean, first of all, his book, Illustrado, uh, it's a debut novel, and it's, just, it's, a, it's a remarkable tour de force piece of literature. Um, for anybody, much less for somebody, it's a debut because it is so, um, you hate the word postmodern. I do, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but it's something that, it's sort of, there's so many voices going on and it, it is anything but sort of a straight narrative. Um, uh, there's a, some of it, of course, that is uh, not autobiographical, but drawn from a lot of personal experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, but also the amount of creativity and amount of, 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 of inventiveness that is in this book is amazing. And um, I strongly recommend that anybody should read this because it's, um, it's a very interesting take on literature in the world, much less just Asian literature. So thank you for this, this piece. Um, so first of all, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about you. So I mean, as somebody who's, as part of the diaspora of the Philippines, but also and half your life in the Philippines, half your life away from the Philippines. So understand your frame of reference when you think about things. How do you sort of relate to being Filipino, um, having spent so much time outside of it as well, and going back in the past year or so, how's that felt? That's a, that's a funny question I get a lot. Um, and I say funny because I've never considered myself anything but Filipino, and, and I, I, I sort of chafe at you know, being called Filipino American because you know I, I studied in the U.S. or Filipino Canadian because during uh, martial law under Marcos, my family lived there for some years, so I actually have a Canadian passport in addition to my my, my Filipino passport. But even living abroad, I was always Filipino. Um, in Vancouver, where I, I I spent some of my childhood, we were a Filipino household, and home was always in the Philippines. Uh, my parents were constantly going back, and it, it felt like we were just studying or, or living in Vancouver. I didn't know any differently. Um, and I think that that's not uh, an uncommon occurrence whatsoever for Filipinos. 
we are colonizing the world. Well, we are several times colonized uh, by, by the Spanish, by the Americans. Um, we have this colonial mentality and we overlook the fact that we are um, raising the next generation of so many different cultures and we are building their buildings um, and their monuments and, and, and their societies. Um, there are Filipinos uh, everywhere. They, it said there were Filipinos in every co um, continent. Uh, and I don't know if this is apocryphal, but even in, in Antarctica there are apparently Filipinos at the McMurdo uh, research station. It must be um, cool for them. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. But we Filipinos are chameleons and we can survive anywhere. Um, and I, I think that's a great strength that we are only slowly starting to become comfortable with uh, as the colonizers of the world. We, we are, you know, it's funny. Um, we're, we're in every profession, we're, we're um, at, at every level of society. Um, we have a lot of uh, celebrities like um, uh, um, Enrique Iglesias is Filipino. You know? we, we say he's Filipino even if he's only half Filipino. Um, uh, who else? Uh, uh, Bruno Mars, and Bruno, 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 Bruno Mars is Filipino. Um, um, Nicole Scherzinger is, a, is Filipino. Um, uh, Rob Schneider, the actor, the comedian, he's, he's, he's Filipino. Even though they're only half, we like to claim them. Um, except for the one, the Andrew Cunana, the, the guy who killed Versace. Um, <laughs> he's half Filipino, but we say, oh yeah, he's only half Filipino. So we're not proud of him. But that's the Filipino experience is a global, is a global experience. So to, to me, it's it's. Yeah. Being out in the world um, hasn't been odd to me whatsoever. I do like work, working in Abu Dhabi as I do now. Um, I'm a professor of literature and, and creative writing at uh, NYU there. And, you know, the Filipinos outnumber the Emiratis. Yeah. Um, I was speaking more to Gallo. They're, they're the ones building the Emirates anyway. I mean, the people from yeah. the Philippines and people from. South Asia, right? Yeah, exactly. It's being built on the, on, the, on the labor, on the backs of people from that part of the world, aren't they? Well, I think it's it's forty percent uh, are Indian, twenty yes. twenty five percent are Filipino, right. and Pakistani, and then the Emiratis are only, I think twelve or fifteen percent. Right. Yeah. So then going back to you, you mentioned uh, earlier when we were talking that you've actually been living back in Manila now for the past year or so. In in twenty fifteen, I moved back. That's right. Um, yeah, two years ago. Right? Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time. <clears throat> focusing really just on writing fiction. I mean, I'm trying to make it. Um, when I was living and studying in, in, in Manila, I, I had to make a choice. If I wanted to become a writer, do I go up through the academia, get published locally, um, struggle with all the infighting and all of the politics amongst the Filipino writers, um, and I had always been an outsider because I, I, I was born into a privileged family. And my father's a politician, you know, like we're a Filipino-Chinese um, you know, business family. Um, so I was always an outsider, so it, it felt right for me to leave in a way. It was easy for me to leave. Um, and I made the decision to leave. It was a strategic one. I said, well, given that we have this colonial mentality as Filipinos, if I want to be right at home, I have to make it abroad. So I went and I studied at Columbia. I, I, I did an MFA. Um, I studied under the great Filipino writer Jessica Hagedorn, um, uh, as well as other uh, New York writers. Um, and I, I really tried to, to be a writer that way, knowing that if I could get published overseas, then people at home would take me seriously. Um, I, I just, I know how the game is, so I, I just, I decided to play it that way. Um, and Living, I moved to Montreal, I moved to Australia. I did my PhD there in literature, and then I, I, I published Illustrado in, in 2008. After much uh, struggle as, as a writer, um, I, I was trying to find an agent who would find me an editor, um, and I tried for many, many years. I, I, I got all sorts of rejection slips. Um, I had read that F. Scott Fitzgerald wallpapered the wall of his study with rejection slips. So, you know, being an aspiring writer, I did the exact same thing. Uh, forgetting that F. Scott Fitzgerald went crazy. Um, but luckily, uh, because of the Man Asian Literary Prize, I, in 2007 that came out, and I, I submitted my... At the time, it was meant to discover or, or to celebrate uh, unpublished manuscripts from Asian writers. So in 2007, I, I submitted. I, I didn't even get on the long list. Um, 2008 came around after having spent a whole year revising it, 
Um, and I, yeah, I got on the long list, and I thought I was, I cried, I got very excited. I'm Filipino, so we cry a lot, we're emotional. Um, and then I got on the short list, and I, I cried again, and I thought, well, I got to go to Hong Kong for this lavish uh, award ceremony, I'll get drunk and eat dim sum, and, and uh, it was gracefully, but maybe be, being on the short list, I, I would have, I'd be on the radars of agents. And then I won, and everything changed for me overnight. I, I won the lottery. Um, it really was just a, the, a, the stroke of luck in terms of the, the tastes of, of, the, of the judges. And everything changed for me then. And after that, I thought, well, I need to be out overseas doing the literary circuit, um, working on my next book. You know, they say that you have your whole life to write your first book, and then 18 months to write your second, because that's when your publisher is putting pressure on you uh, to publish. And that was, yeah, I, I sold my book in um, 2008 um, and supposed to have published the next book in 2012. You know, um, so many, many years later, um, I'm, I'm still trying to finish that damn book. Um, but it was in 2015 when I went home um, that I discovered that that was exactly what I needed. I needed to go home, I needed to get in touch again with the Philippines, with the Philippine politics and society, and, and be home again. Right, right. And so I spent the last uh, year covering the Philippine elections and, and, um, and reacquainting myself with how things are working there. Well, I mean, obviously this is, for those of you who don't know, this is a um, very interesting book in many respects. One of them is that it's not autobiographical, but the protagonist's name is Miguel Sibuko, um, that was delivered, obviously. Um, it and it's about a overseas, young overseas writer coming home to unravel the mystery about his mentor, a more seasoned uh, um, uh, a writer who was found drowned, I guess, in the Hudson, I guess. In the Hudson River in New York City. Yeah. Um, so it's about sort of coming home tale and what you discover and about identity in that sense, right? Yes, very much so. Right, right. So that, now that you're back, you've been there back for two years, and now you're writing your second book or so. What's the evolution of the next book, of your sophomore effort, if you will? Well, it was a book that I started. I, I had written a draft in 2007, halfway through writing Illustrato, because Illustrato, Illustrato's several different narrative threads, right. several different types of forms right. and genres. Like there's poetry, short fiction, inter emails, um, uh, blog posts, interviews, dirty jokes, all of that. And it, it's a pastiche, really, of, of Philippine society at the time. Um, starting from the Illustrados, who were the, the enlightened, uh, that, that's, that's what Illustrado means, they were the young men who moved to, uh, to Europe to study in the late 1800s, um, learned all they could, returned to the Philippines, um, and were instrumental in, in starting the Philippine Revolution. So, you know, I mean, this coming at home tale isn't, or this theme isn't, it wasn't really just for me. I, I think that it's, it's a very Filipino thing. Um, starting with the Illustrato, starting now, continuing with the, the OFWs, the Overseas Filipino Workers, uh, foreign workers who, who are, uh, as I said, building the world, um, and myself. It's, 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 it's part of that Filipino reality. And you say it's not autobiographical, but in a way it is. I, I, I deliberately named the author, uh, the, the protagonist, Miguel Sikuko, because they say, you know, the first novel is always autobiographical. You write what you know, is what we teach in, in creative writing classes. And what do you know better than yourself? All the things you've struggled with, um, all your experiences that you want to make sense of. And I found it disingenuous to thinly veil my first effort as autobiographical, but not, you know, by naming the, the protagonist Mike Sikiko or something like that. You know, something ridiculous, as, as a lot of authors do. Um, and I think that good writing is honest writing, and so I decided to own it. And, and yeah, this the Miguel in, in this book is my own worst tendencies. He's my regrets. He's the fears of who I would become. Um, I, I figured if I'm going to point my finger at the rest of this very corrupt, complicated, broken society, uh, I should first and foremost point my finger at the man in the mirror, myself. Um, I want to move on to uh, the issue of drugs and talking about reality versus perception. Um, and 
I mean, I think it's relatively rare that in a populous country like the Philippines has roughly 100 million people, that drug trade, drug addiction, can be like the headline issue of a, of, of a presidential election. And yet last year, that's what it seemed to be. Um, and so, just to sort of get the facts straight about drug use in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it really that much worse than other countries? Is it just sort of, um, again, a, a cause celebrated for politicians to use the way that happened last year? I think it's both. It's, it's certainly felt um, across Philippine society because Philippine society is so broken. So if you're living in the slum areas and you're being mugged for 20 pesos or you know, the equivalent of 50 pence or something like that on, on a regular basis by this, this, this shabu addict, uh, methamphetamine, which is discouraged now in, in the Philippines, you, you certainly feel it, and, and you certainly want someone who will make that stop. Um, you can understand why, um, you know, and it's, it's all well and good. I grew up privileged, here I am, you know, drinking Prosecco in, in a comfortable chair with, with fine people speaking English, uh, with, you know, uh, wired to a microphone, um, which is, you know, my fantasy to have at home, you know, a microphone <laughs> and a comfy chair. Um, and so it's, it's easy for us to say, well, no, you know, what about human rights? What about, um, what about these grand ideals and what is true and what is not? And is the number 1.8 million drug users or is it really as 4 million as, as Mr. Duterte says? Um, the fact of the matter is, is that people were feeling um, the, the violence and the danger in the Philippines because of this. And they wanted somebody who would make it stop. And, so the, the, that's one side of the coin. On the other side is, is this gentleman, this, this dynastic, traditional politician. His father was a governor. Um, he made his, his, his renown by, by cleaning up Davao, which was a notoriously dangerous um, city in, in, in the south of the Philippines, um, facing uh, insurrection from the communists, from, from Muslim separatists regular bombings. Um, it was really a no man's land before Duterte came in. And he came in and he cleaned it up. And he cleaned it up using very familiar and effective methods that we see throughout history um, used by strongmen. And um, I went to Davao recently to determine, you know, to, to understand why, why is this a case study? Why is this a, a reason uh, an example of what Duterte could do, and it was incredible. It's a fantastic city. It's clean, it's safe. Um, because it's clean and safe, the middle, the middle class has gone out into the plazas and into the streets and reclaimed it. It's a living city. So it, it's not like Manila or the other cities where, where uh, people hide behind high walls or, or tinted car windows and, and, and go to the malls because it's, it's uh, safer. Um, Davao really is something to be proud of, so I get it, um, and I want to give credit where credit is due, but that was accomplished through the use of death squads, right. and they're called the, the, the Davao death squads, DDS, as they were called, which is really interesting because now the, the supporters of Duterte have co-opted that name and they call themselves the DDS, which stands for Die Hard Duterte Supporters, which to me is just so macabre and tacky. You know, how can you take the name, the acronym of, of, of a death squad? But they do. And um, so we have to understand all of these different complexities and, and all, all of the frustration. Uh, and the thing is, the Philippines, we've really screwed things up. We, we, we were a naturally rich country. Um, we were once the, 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 the dragon economy of Asia. Right. Um, and over the subsequent generations and decades, uh, it's just become more and more corrupt. Um, the dynasties have taken more and more power from their democracy, and people are frustrated, and they want change. And if this, was, if this is what democracy looks like, then screw democracy, let's have something different. And so that's how Duterte came in, um, really talking about drugs, really talking about law and order, really promising to be the savior. Yeah, you forget, the Philippines is, or maybe you don't forget, but um, the Philippines is, is, is I think, 80-something, 80 80% 80 um, Catholic. 
a Christian. Right? So we have, we've always had this savior complex. We want a hero who will come in and save everything. But the fact of the matter is, it's, and, or, or we have villains, we have Ferdinand Marcos, or, you know, who's a dictator who ruined everything for us. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's more complicated than that. Nuance is, is necessary, uh, that nuance is necessary for going to find truth. And the, the nuance of the whole situation is that no one person is responsible for how screwed up the country is. Just as no one person is, is able or capable um, of fixing it up for us. Um, and that's really my issue with Dante. Isn't the potty mouth, isn't um, a lot of the things, that the policies that I take issue with, you know, the, 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 the rehabilitation of the Marcoses, the kowtowing to China, the, the, the extrajudicial killings, the, the disdain for, for um, democratic checks and balances. My issue is, is that he's saying, I'm going to fix this for you in six months time or one year's time. And if you ask me what I want as a politician who will say, I need your help, I can't do this on my own, I'm going to seek to empower you citizens to help me, and I'm going to bolster the democratic uh, institutions that we do have, rather than this guy who says, I'm going to come in, drugs, 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 terrorism, terrorism, kill, 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 let's get rid of everything and start, start uh, anew. History shows us that that doesn't work. Right? And I can't help but see resonances with this inflated uh, drug number. You know, they say there are one point, the Dangerous Drugs Board in the Philippines, which is the government institution tasked with counting how many drug users there are, counted in 2015, which was the, when they, the last survey, that there were 1.8 million drug users, people who used drugs once in one year um, when, when they were counting. So that's, that's what um, the government knows to be true. Um, but Duterte comes in and says there are 3 million, and then he says there are 3.4 million drug addicts. Now he's saying there are 4 million, or 4.8 million. It's always changing. And yet the Philippine National Police, the Dangerous Drugs Boards, they're, they're, they are all basing their policies and their, their strategies on that 1.8 million figure. Right. And just as a frame of reference, I mean, if it is roughly about 1.5% or you know, between 1.5% and 2% of the national population, that's significantly lower than the, the, the global average is, and on par with other ASEAN nations mm -hmm. uh, on, on a per capita you know, drug usage basis. Yes. So, I mean, if that's the case then, I mean, how can that be such a major proxy, I guess, as a campaign and platform that actually ends up winning? I mean, like Trump has got a bunch of other things going on, and mm -hmm. Brexit has a whole bunch of other things going on. So much of what Duterte, at least in the international press, seemed to be saying, Duterte, I mean, his leading edge was basically law and order around drug use. So was that, is drug use really just sort of a proxy for something else? Yeah. You know, sort of I a containment of chaos, if you will, or...? or, or? It's a credible proxy. It, it, it's certainly mm -hmm. an issue. Um, but it's, I, I can't help but see resonances with the rise of Nazism in Germany, with, with, with or, or um, dictatorship under Marcos, you know, the, the, Hitler needed, needed a, a villain, so he chose the Jews. Um, Marcos needed a villain, and, and so he chose the communists. Um, you know, there, there, was, there were real resentments and there were real issues um, regarding those, those, um, uh, those subjects in that society at the time. But Duterte has found something, and, and he's run with it. And now, of course, there's terrorism. You know, there's in Marawi and Mindanao, mm -hmm. there, there's all this violence. There have been bombings as well um, from Muslim separatists believed in, in Davao um, and kidnappings. Um, well, that's what's kind of gone over the past couple of decades anyway, hasn't it? Or, it or, has, and or it, it, it fluctuates, you know, because right. the, the South has um, the yeah. Abu Sayyaf, which are sort of affiliated with the Al Qaeda. Um, but that's the thing, is that terrorism wasn't really something felt by the Filipinos, whereas drug use was. So, and I, I don't think that Duterte, and, and I have to give him this, I don't think he's just saying, well, what issue can I seize on and, and, and manipulate? I actually think he really believes in it. And, and these are, well, what we're facing um, is very much, yeah, somebody who has a disdain for democrat, democratic institutions, but we're, we're facing somebody who um, has seen what he could do in Davao, seen how effective it is, and wants to replicate it across right. the country. Okay. Yeah. 
You know, in the meantime, what does that mean? That means giving police absolute impunity, promising them pardons, pro promising some of them even um, promotions uh, for, for all the killings. Um, cops are, are allegedly being given um, monetary rewards for, for every person that they kill or bring in. Um, and, you know, one of the things I've done when I went back to the Philippines was in the lead up to the election, I went and I went to all of the, 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 the final campaigns, um, sorties of, the, of every candidate. And I saw when I went to Duterte, it was obvious to me that he was going to win. It was, it really felt like a revolution. These were people from all across the Philippines, from every um, level of society, who really believed in him. And it was intoxicating. And even I started to hope that, well, maybe, he, maybe as, as, as his uh, apologists were saying, maybe all of his rhetoric is just hyperbole. Maybe it's all just exaggeration. Uh, maybe he doesn't really mean it. And in, in, in the months that, that followed, um, what I was doing was I was writing about it. I have a regular monthly column, uh, an opinion column, for the International New York Times, where I write about Philippine politics. And it's an opinion column, but I'd like it to be an informed opinion column. So with my research fund and, and my savings, I go back and forth between Abu Dhabi and I spend my long weekends and every holiday I have going into the slums, going, talking to the people who are most affected, going to these jails where you know, there's a cell half the size of this room and there are 93 different, 93 inmates in, living in that for years. Um, it's so packed that, that, that they have to take turns just sitting down. Um, I went to funerals, I went to wakes. Um, I've been to crime scenes that, that keep me up at night because there's blood all over the place. But these are crime scenes as a result. As a result. Of the crack down, as a yeah. Of what's happening before. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I'm talking to the witnesses and then I'm talking to the police and hearing their statements. And the witnesses are all saying something completely different from what the cops are saying. You know, and I, 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 I talk to the families of those who are being killed and they say this is what happened and then you hear from the cops and it, it's a completely different story. And um, it's, it's really concerning to me. Um, so, you know, as a writer, this is, this is something that I've struggled with. I write fiction, usually. Um, but that's the long game, you know, that's, that's maybe the bigger picture. And, and, I'm, I'm so angry and so afraid of what, everything that's happening in the Philippines that, that I've really focused now on journalism. I'm, I'm, I write an informed opinion column where I go in and I see things uh, to corroborate really what all the other journalists are saying um, and to see if what all the propagandists, all the blogs, all the fake news sites, um, if they actually have any, anything credible um, um, behind it. And what I'm seeing for myself, and I'm encouraging everybody to go see for themselves, because nobody is. Um, it's what we're seeing in the Philippines is, a, is an information war. But what I'm seeing for myself is systemic abuse uh, from, from, from a justice system that doesn't work, from uh, um, targeted on a sector of society, the poorest, who have nowhere else to turn to except the government, who is now victimizing them via the authorities, by, by the cops. So, because the question I have, therefore, is the use of race itself. I mean, um, how it is, so, the most prevalent drug is crystal meth, or, or shabu, right? Yeah. Followed by the marijuana from what I read, and then, yeah. and then ecstasy, and the, the cocktail of other things that go on. The rich drugs. The rich drugs, yeah. Like used by the people who aren't being targeted at all. Right, yeah, so that really, that it really is, so like, I crack coke, sorry. Like crack cocaine in the U.S. Yes, um, it's similar to that, where it really is a issue for the underclass or for the very poorest. Is that yes, right? and th that's exactly right. Okay, and, and they're they're taking these drugs. If I may just uh, sure, uh, jump in there, a lot of them are taking these drugs because you know it keeps you up. Crystal meth will keep right. you up for you know thirty six hours, um, and so you know if you're a tri tricycle driver um, or if you're a laborer. That means you can have, do three shifts straight. I mean, it's it's not always the case. Yes, people are doing it to feel good, or people are doing it to, 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 to not feel hopeless. But I, I have journalist colleagues who have gone out to really talk to these drug users. And a lot of them say, this is why I'm doing it. Yeah, so the irony of it is, is that 
the drug that they're taking to sort of try to get themselves out of that situation is sort of keeping them shackled there. Yeah, or they're selling it because they want to be able to send their kids to school. Of course, that's right. You know, um, and so we're not really by killing them, we're getting rid of the problem, perhaps, but we're not uh, attacking or targeting the, the root causes of it all. Right, and also, of course, can you talk a little bit about the supply chain as well? Yeah, so where it comes from, obviously, there's a lot of government complicity. Yeah. yeah, whether or not the crackdown is also happening at that level, or whether or not they're just targeting users and you know the small little bounties and those kinds of things. It, the, the drug is manufactured, and it's a synthetic drug, right? And so the, the components are, are, are shipped in from China, which is ironic because you know we've got this great relationship now with China because we're basically letting them, you know, we're bending over and letting them have our way with us. But those are triads as opposed to the government itself. Yeah, exactly. Which was right. a bit different. But, you know, the government hasn't really um, focused on them. And there have been cases where Duterte in Davao, you know, released, you know, a, a dozen Chinese nationals um, and let them go home to China, even though they were caught in the drug trade. So why are the poor people who are, who are poor Filipinos who are using this or selling this, why are they the ones being affected? And, and yet there are no, there hasn't been a single drug lord um, prosecuted or targeted. Um, the, the, there are very few uh, politicians who have been um, targeted as, as drug coddlers, and, and even that is questionable because the ones who have been, the, the, the two or three or, or a handful of those who have been um, targeted are, are opposition politicians. You know, so there's a lot of politicking there, and it's really hard to know. Um, but the supply chain, according to Mr. Duterte, and according to a lot of people, it's the, the, the drugs um, have tainted everything. They've tainted the cops, they've tainted the politicians. Yeah. They've, um, but it, it, it really feels to a lot of people um, who, who think like I do, or who have gone out to see like I have. Um, and I, I make that point specifically because a lot of the propagandists of Mr. Duterte um, live abroad. Uh, don't go home and, and see this, uh, see this stuff. They 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 don't make the effort. Um, a lot of us who have seen it um, do acknowledge that that it is a systemic problem. Uh, but I don't know if we we're becoming a narco state like uh, Mr. Duterte claims. Right. Well, um, I mean, there are the headlines that. You know, Duterte named 150 government officials who were involved in the trade. Obviously, it's incredibly pervasive from local levels all the way up to you know, the, the, the judicial branch. I mean, mm -hmm. presumably, you know, <coughs> it is very pervasive. And so then, at what point, if that's the case, then, I mean, how do you define what is a narco state versus what's not a narco state? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, how do we define it? And how, where does that definition come from? He keeps saying it's a narco state, or his supporters keep saying it's a narco state, um, and it is certainly a problem. But I, I can't say it being more of a problem than many other places where. Well, that's the, the argument. Same fact had a that's the argument. Exists. When you look at the percentage of how many people it's, right. it's influencing, but you know because things are so broken and poor and corrupt in the Philippines, that it, the influence, even though it's just a small percentage, is, is very pervasive in, in, in the barangays, in the in the communities. Right. Right, but uh, one of the pieces that I did recently um, for, for the New York Times was about, it was titled The, the Injustice System. And it's about the Philippine uh, justice system, where, you know, the, the judiciary is understaffed, um, you know, a quarter of all courts don't even have judges, um, public prosecutors and defendants are also understaffed, um, you know, we're lacking hundreds, <coughs> if not thousands of people uh, to, to, to protect the people. Uh, the prosecutors working with um, the cops have a very cozy relationship, so they're, they're, the prosecutors are hesitant to throw out a case for lack of evidence um, because they don't want to upset their police colleagues. Because the, co the police are also judged not on um, convictions, which means they need to gather evidence and, and build a case against someone. They're judged basically on, on arrests, um, which means that they'll arrest people, throw them into the justice system, which is overcrowded, corrupt, understaffed. And so people um, languish in, 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 in jail 
for you know three, four, five years, even though they're innocent, until finally the the, the system processes them, spits them out, ruined, um, and only twenty five percent of all people arrested ever get convicted. So that means the criminals aren't being arrested, and the and the poor people are, are, or the poor innocent people are being criminalized because they're stuck in these terrible jails. Um, and when, when, I, when I was doing the research for this, talking to the, the uh, human rights advocates, the lawyers, the defendants, the cops, um, the, the prisoners themselves, um, it occurred to me that this is, it, it was very clear to me that this is the root of why we are support, why so many people are supporting the Duterte uh, violence. We're saying, well, the drug war doesn't, uh, the, the, the justice system doesn't work. Criminals are being set free. Um, there's there's no punitive action. Uh, people aren't afraid of the law. The law doesn't work. So let's just kill them, right? It's easier. It's it's cheaper. You know, um, it makes sense. We we can understand why that works. But what frustrates me is in, in the 30 years of, of Mr. Duterte under in Davao, and in the year that he's been president, or even the time he was campaigning, not one mention. No, 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 no. Yeah, he hasn't really. Um, applied himself to fixing the justice system, right? If he was really serious about this, he would empower the systems that would punish the criminals. So, so what happened in Davao? I mean, to make it such a shining city on a hill, so to speak, I mean, obviously there's something right there, because it's an example he can point to. Um, what did he do correctly there, if you will, um, that might he applied on a national level if that's even possible. Well, he's done some amazing things. You know, he, he worked with different parties. He worked with the leftists. He, he worked uh, with the Muslims. Uh, in, 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 in Mindanao, there are there more than uh, a dozen uh, tribes who are all, all um, um, jockeying for power and positions and, and, and representation. Um, and he, he appointed vice mayors um, in each of the tribes so that they could come out and air their concerns. Um, he, he passed uh, LGBTQ um, uh, legislation, an anti-discrimination um, uh, law. Um, he established a 911 um, emergency helpline, so that, that, that uh, you know, if you've got a problem, and you know, here we take it for granted that you can call, what is it here, 000 or something? Um, what's the number you call if you? 999? Is it 999? Yeah. We take for granted that we have it. In the Philippines, you didn't have that. So who are you going to call if you've got a ghostbuster? I know. The words didn't leave my mind. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry. I realized it's going to be a punchline. We are Filipinos. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, he established that for, for Davao. And, you know, he wants to roll this out across the country. And, of course, we want that. So, do you see any... I mean, beyond the extrajudicial killings and the things that get the headlines, I mean, on the ground, do you see anything happening on a systemic level where there's some kind of inclusive dialogue going on to, more, to, to on education rather than just fear? Education on, and trying to crack down on the, on the supply chain. That's the unfortunate that. thing, is that, you know, there are really good policies and initiatives that he's trying to roll out, and he's appointed some talented uh, people of, of great integrity into positions in, in government, but um, he, his rhetoric and his focus on drugs and killing and his promises to kill have really overshadowed that. And people like to, his supporters, like to blame um, the media, the destabilizing New York Times, um, these writers who, who were, you know, um, discredited because they're part of mainstream media, all of that. Um, though those people are no longer uh, the, the the things that they are reporting, they're reporting basically the, the, the everything that Duterte says, everything that Duterte does, but they're being blamed and not Duterte for the things he's saying or doing. And you know that's that's kind of, I guess part of the information war. That's part of the great debate that the Filipinos are undergoing now. Um, it's, you know, um, why isn't Duterte being 
cast as somebody who's doing good stuff along with the bad stuff. Well, I mean, in journalism, there's that saying, if it bleeds, it leads, mm. right? If there are people dying in the street, if they're taped up um, and left with notes saying, don't follow me, I'm a drug pusher, are, are we not going to report that as a front, as front page? And they're, they're dying in the hundreds, if not thousands. Are we not going to report that versus, you know, appointing a good uh, environmental environment minister who wants to shut down the mines? Like, I mean, what's more important? And, and you know, a lot of people, a lot of detective supporters will say, well, we need to look at it in, in, in the broader context. Uh, if we can fix our economy, if we can fix the society, then, you know, we won't have these drug problems and we won't have the inequality. And it's, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Let's, let's take care of the things that people need. It's like what happened in Singapore, that everybody likes to say, you know, the Singapore model. But a lot of us, or a lot of people who share my views, can't get over the fact that there are thousands of people being killed. Yeah. Has the pace of that attenuated at all in terms of the actual killings? I mean, there's a lot of news of it in the first six months. Um, less of it now, I don't know why, maybe it's just other things. That the the news cycle goes on. on. Yeah, but, if, but from what you can tell, is that level of crackdown and violence, is that continuing? It, it's petered out a, a little bit, possibly because people are, are afraid or, okay. or, or they've run out of people to kill. <laughs> um, well, you got one No, one. whole communities in, in Metro Manila, for example, have emptied because all the young men are afraid, and, and so they go off, they move off to the provinces or they go to other communities. And we're not talking just the drug people, people who are associated with drugs. The police will go into a community and in the middle of the night and, and bang on every door and say, bring out your men. And the men will be made to line up there with their hands behind their backs. And the women and the children are sent away so that, the, that there will be no witnesses as to what happens. Uh, in one community I went to, 80 of these men were taken in. Um, and you know, a few days later, you know, several of them were, were, were found killed and many of them were just kind of put into, the, into jail, even though they had no prior uh, record, they had no, um, they tested negative for drugs. Um, and, you know, it was just part of that quota system, that money-making system with the cops. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how I got into that, but yeah, that's, that, that's what's happening. Um, but, but, but even still, so you see... Oh yeah, even you, still. You, you're going to the slums yeah. still, I guess, yeah. on a regular basis in Europe. So, in the heels of a lot of the media attention, particularly a big New York Times photo essay by Daniel Barahulak, um, with the headline, They're Slaughtering Us Like Animals, which was a quote from, from one of the people who, 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 who was victimized, uh, and which ultimately won the Pulitzer Prize uh, for incredible reportage. Um, on the heels of that, the cops started to change their, their methods. Prior to that, they were very eager to show what was happening. Um, they wanted to, the, the media to see all these arrests, all of the, the cleaning up of the dregs of society. But as it became clear that international media wasn't impressed, they changed. They started killing people, not on the streets, but killing them in the homes where the cameras couldn't be. They, 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 they started, the cops started whisking away the bodies to hospitals, which where media is not allowed to enter, uh, rather than bringing them to the morgue, right? Even so, why would you bring a dead body to the hospital? So there's a lot of subterfuge going on. Um, and because of that um, heat on, on the drug war uh, from international community, uh, which, you know, Duterte said, you know, fuck you, EU, um, you sons of whores, uh, you know, Obama, all of that sort of stuff, um, you know, human rights, well, what, what, what good is human rights if they're not human? You know, that, that's his sort of rhetoric. But even then, you know, the, 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 the powers that be felt they needed to adjust. And so what was called um, Operation Double Barrel um, was reinstated a few weeks after, well, it was, it was um, suspended for just a few weeks. And then it was uh, reinstated as um, Operation Double Barrel Reloaded. <laughs> Yeah, and it still continues, although the method um, has been changing. The method of how to clean up the bodies, the method of, of how to hide it, um, has certainly been changing. So you don't see any evolution of the war? I mean, it's still sort of basically, from what you can tell, a lot of, you know, if you will, boots on the ground, it's just being done behind the cameras or the camera yeah. turned off rather than 
Yeah, the, the police cordons are further out so that the cameras can come in. There have been no middle class uh, or very, very, very few middle class uh, uh, Filipinos who have been targeted in all of this. Um, there have been no drug lords who have been brought to justice. You said earlier, uh, when I was chatting with you, that what's been happening is sort of a wet dream of the middle class. Yeah, I have a friend who's a political pundit and he was saying, yeah, what's happening really is the wet dream of the middle class. The, the approval ratings of Mr. Duterte have gone up amongst the rich and amongst the middle classes. But the poorest uh, of the poor, um, the people who are really feeling it, that's dropped by 11%. That's a big drop, you know. But the rich people, the middle class people, the comfortable people, people like me and people like maybe all of us here, you know, it's great. Crime is down by 40%. Yeah, I know, so one will say, yeah, I know, murder is actually up according to the, to, to the National Police by 31%. But, you know, that's fine, it doesn't matter because that, that's only the drug dealers. Those, these are the people who don't deserve the human rights. You know, they don't deserve due process. They ask for addiction is a choice. And these are the sort of justifications people are making for this. And it really is a philosophical um, debate that's happening in the Philippines. Do we jettison these people who are dragging us down? Um, or do we find a way to, to help them? And that's really what we're arguing about now. Are people like you, who have this voice, allowed to express it without getting, you know, the calls in the middle of the night and pictures of your kids going to school and that kind of thing? That a lot of people will also say that I call them the the damn the damn propagandists, which stands for Duterte Arroyo Marcos, because that's uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo was a president who was in jail, and a lot of this. Uh, um, these online sites, these fake news sites came about um, and, and fighting for her cause. And, and so Duterte, Arroyo, and the Marcoses are all, all being um, supported by these propagandists. Um, and and these, the, the, these, these trolls, these troll farms, this, this mob, this online mob, um, have been so assiduous and so energetic in attacking anyone who will dissent um, that the the government doesn't need to censor anyone the, 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 because the supporters are doing it for them. I get a lot of death threats. I get a lot of threats of violence. I get a lot of attacks. And all I do is I, I publish a piece in the New York Times about the justice system and talk about how endemic it is and how it's it started you know, several administrations ago and how it's continuing. And of course, you know, someone will screen cap things I say online, and they'll attack my father who was in politics. They'll attack me. They'll they'll write me things saying, you know, that they, they want to stab me if I go to Davao. Um, so it's the mob, this organic mob, although that's debatable how, how organic it is. Um, but this mob is doing the dirty work of the administration. And the thing is, the media has become, uh, which is part of the zeitgeist everywhere. The media has been so discredited um, by those who benefit from discrediting it that um, nobody's listening to us anyway, right? So they don't need to shoot me, they don't need to kill me, they don't need to, to shut down newspapers because everybody's on Facebook anyway, they're not reading the newspapers and they're yeah, reading the fake blogs. Read, right? Yeah. So as the last question before I open up the audience, so uh, in one minute or less, how would you compare Duterte to Trump? <laughs> it's obviously you know, there are a lot of things where you say where people pick, you know, like scratch out the drop and in trouble, it's the same thing happening at, on a different scale. It, it's funny because I get a lot of Duterte supporters uh, who hate Trump. And really? they, they cannot see like, they cannot see the resonance between the two of them. Well, that's, not, that's not saying a lot about Trump then. Well, I don't know. I mean I don't think we need to say a lot about Trump. No, we don't <laughs> know, Trump feels to me like he's in it for himself. Duterte is not. Okay. Duterte really believes that what he is doing is for the good of the country. Okay. And his supporters, they are not my enemies, even though they attack me. Um, they are people who disagree with me um, as to the proper route to get to, um, to that shared vision of, 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 of prosperity and peace for the Philippines. And, you know, 
I think that that is something that, 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 that is shared with Trump supporters as well, right? They also want a better life for, 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 for America. Um, but, I don't know, it's, it's hard. I mean, there's Le Pen, there's Erdogan, there's, there's Putin. There's, I mean, there's so many uh, of these rising strong men who, who, who um, are rejecting liberalism. Right. Uh, but the Philippines doesn't have the equivalent of the Steve Bannon, somebody who, in a way, sort of, Trump can sort of take, and that kind of empowers him and gives him a pill to stand on. No, the I Philippines... Mean, what what, what Tarte is about is about what, Tarte, is what he's about. Yeah, and, and what, what's interesting and fascinating and kind of exciting is that his support, um, it doesn't come from this master, this Bengali, um, Steve Bannon. We, we don't have a, a Joseph Goebbels like, like him uh, in the Philippines. It really is grassroots support. And I find that really exciting. Um, but I really believe that we are backing the wrong horse. He's, he's a guy with the message of change. Um, and we want that change, and we're, we suddenly feel empowered to go after that change. Um, but he, he's the wrong man for it. He, he's fooling us. Um, and I think that's the same thing with, with Trump. You know, he, he came in with, you know, I'm going to drain the swamp. I'm going to change things. Um, I'm going to present something new for all of you. I, I don't have any plans. I don't have any... Um, outline for how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it because I've done it before. Look at me, I'm a billionaire, right? Um, I guess, yeah, in a weird way, that's kind of like Duterte as well, you know? Look what I did in Davao, I cleaned right. up as well. There are resonances, but I think it's, it's, it undermines discourse um, and, and, and our understanding of nuance to really lump them together. That being said, they are friends. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, Questions, comments? Yeah. Thank you very much. That's been very engaging. I want to ask you a question about the appropriate foreign policy response. Uh, we're about to have an election here. What should the Prime Minister do or the Foreign Secretary do in response to the situation? Well, that's a great question. I, mean, I, I, I fear that might be above my pay grade. Um, but I've been having Prosecco and I've got the microphone. It's tough because if you alienate the, 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 the country, um, you're, you're less able to work with them towards your shared goals. And, and we're, we're seeing what's happened um, with Mr. Duterte rejecting EU grants. Um, he was upset at the EU uh, criticizing um, the, the, the human rights uh, allegations uh, and violations. Um, and so he says, you know what, I can't stand this hypocrisy. Forget it. You know what, I've got these, these, um, these, these loans offered to us by China, um, and I don't need your stupid grants. Um, and I think we have to be very, uh, very wary, very careful of being put in a situation like that. Um, that being said, you know, the, the grants were contingent on certain standards and, 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 and certain uh, agreements and um, the EU has every right to, to, um, to demand that the, those standards are met. Um, but then again, you know, just as Duterte has every right to reject them. But who suffers from that are, are the people who are benefiting from the grants, the poor people, the, the programs in Mindanao where they're mostly being challenged to. Um, so I, I, I think... Um, uh, Prime Minister May has to tread carefully there, but at the same time, you know, you see what other people are doing, like um, Trump calling up to dare to saying, "Oh, his war on drugs is great," you know, and like, I fully support it. And, you know, who we are. Um, I, 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 yeah, like like I said, it's a hard question to to answer, um, but really, it's I think it boils down to real politics. Uh, if we're going to work as an international community, how do we make sure we don't uh, burn those bridges and shut those doors so that Duterte says, fuck you, you sons of a whore, sons of whores, uh, I'm not going to listen to you anymore and I'm not even going to answer your calls. Uh, and so that will have to be the diplomatic um, balancing act that, that Mrs. Bay will have to uh, uh, 
I execute, and I hope she does well. I, not Mr. Corbyn's job. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, it might certainly be. Um, we'll see how the election goes. So you, you, you paint a very bleak picture of the Philippines right now, and Duterte aside, you know, the society and the judiciary and the police. Um, do you think this is a product of a sort of a long decline, or has something changed over the past 20 or 30 years? Yeah, well, that's interesting. So let's talk about 30 years. In 1986, about 30 years ago, um, we regained our democracy. Uh, Marcos was ousted. We had a new um, administration under Corazon Aquino. We got rid of the old constitution that, that was made under Marcos. And we wrote a new one, which included all these checks and balances. So there was a lot of... <coughs> excuse me. Um, a lot of optimism in terms of what democracy could be, and yeah, after having been denied democracy for 14 years under Mr. Marcos, um, there was faith in what democracy could do. The People Power Revolution, if you remember it, I, I certainly remember watching it on TV from Canada, where, where my family was living at the time, um, really was an incredible thing. Um, and so much so that it was you know, emulated uh, across the world in, in other uh, similar people power revolutions. But in those 30 years, we have failed, and I think this is this has resonances everywhere um, nowadays. We have failed to create a, a truly democratic, um, inc uh, in inclusive um, society where people are seeing the benefits and feeling empowered by those democratic mechanisms. Um, in the Philippines, we have 80% of our legislature controlled by d d dynasties, by, by families, by, by family businesses. And if it's a family business, who are you going to, to um, put first, the country or, or your family, right? 90% um, of, our, of our governorships are, are, are controlled by dynasties as well. Um, this idea that in a democracy, if you've got a good, if you've got a good heart, and community support and, and vision that no matter how poor you are, no matter what background you have, you can, you can rise and stand for election and one day become president. That is an absolute farce and, and an impossibility in the Philippines. Um, and I think that is really the root of why we have rejected um, democracy, why we're craving a strong man. Um, there, 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 there are these groups called the Duterte Youth in the Philippines mm -hmm. wearing these armbands and doing the Duterte salute, um, holding up signs calling for dictatorship and, and calling for, you know, you know, celebrating Marcos and Duterte in, in, in the same placard as, as the, the necessary strongman for, for Asia and for the Philippines. Um, so these people are frustrated and they want some sort of change. And if, if democracy isn't going to empower us or create opportunities or equality, then let's just go with this guy who, you know, okay, we'll sacrifice all of our, our liberty, many some of our liberties, but at least we can walk home from work safely. At least there aren't drug dealers who are, or, or drug users who are, who are um, mugging us. Um, at least our economy is going to do good. Um, at least if I'm an overseas um, uh, worker living in Abu Dhabi um, or, or, or London, um, and my kids are, are being raised by, uh, without me knowing them because I'm a nanny or I'm a construction worker, at least I know that I've got this government who will keep them safe. Um, you know, 40%, and crime is down 40%. That's robbery, um, rape, um, uh, carjacking, you know, all of these other things. Yeah, and so what it's, if it's up 30%, you know, uh, murder is up 30%. The people being murdered, the people deserve it, right? So we have, it's, the, the roots are definitely, they precede Mr. Duterte, they're much deeper, and they will continue after him if we don't do something. Um, and that's kind of what I'm excited about, about these people who are attacking me, ironically. Um, I'm excited about uh, how politicized everyone has become in the Philippines. Um, I'm excited about how somebody can can gain national or international, um, uh, gain an international audience 
by putting up a blog and talking about you know demanding rights for the Filipinos. You know that's something we haven't seen before. Um, and I, I believe that that's the future if we can channel it and, and stop it from being hijacked by people like Mr. Duterte, who, who are playing on these uh, very deeply entrenched um, resentments and grievances uh, that, that are absolutely legitimate. Other questions? Yes, in the back. Hi, I wonder how you compare the situation in the Philippines to, say, in Turkey, where there's been a, what sounds like a rather similar populist uprising against someone who's essentially a dictator. And it almost seems to me like, um, um, from our, as you pointed out, from our middle class perspective, it's kind of democracy going wrong. You know, people who we don't want to gain power are gaining power. But, but that is democracy, isn't it? Though? It is. So but is that is that maybe we're conflating democracy with like human rights? But maybe those two things exactly. And that, I guess that's the question: to yeah. what do we do if democratically elected leaders propose um, murder, mayhem, and total lack of human rights? Um, yeah. Where do we stand then, as uh, uh, as as we as we said before, comfortably living in a a Western democracy elsewhere and saying, well, we should impose what we think on those countries. Mm, yeah. I, I believe, and, and I think history does show us, that we have to guard the civil liberties that we have now, the, 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 the checks and balances, um, the institutions that hold our leaders to account. We have to guard them now. Um, because if we start making compromises for a little bit of safety, then we're going to lose all of our safety in, in the long run. You know, I, I've lived in Singapore and I, I, I work now for much of the year in, in the Emirates. And these are incredible young countries that in a single generation have, have become affluent and safe, um, a strong middle class, um, but they don't have democracies. You know, the Singaporean uh, government is, is, a, is a sham democracy. Um, and in the Emirates and other countries in the Middle East, they're, they're, they're kingdoms, basically. Um, and because they have absolute power, they can do incredible things. They can build wonderful infrastructure. They can um, silence dissent. They can move at, at a pace uh, and, and in leaps and bounds uh, towards developing that, 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 the, the economy in that society. So it's very alluring to give up, um, to cede our demo democratic, or, which is very slow, it's consensual disagreement, right? And you have one government who comes in and then the next government uh, comes in and, and, uh, and it kind of you take two steps forward and one step back with every change of government, right? Um, it's very alluring to look at what all of these other uh, authoritarian countries um, are doing and saying, well, or thinking, well, maybe we need some of that. Maybe democracy uh, isn't necessary. Um, maybe we can sacrifice some of the, our, our freedoms. Um, but my question always, and nobody has been able to answer this uh, convincingly or answer this period, is yes, a benevolent dictator is well and good. Right? They can do great things. But what happens when they stop being benevolent? How do we get rid of them? How do we get rid of them without resorting to bloodshed? How do we get rid of them without throwing in our support with other terrible uh, warlord leaders who, you know, who, who are almost as bad but not quite as bad? We've seen this throughout history. You look at Latin America, you look at Asia, with all of the strongmen uh, throughout the 70s and the 80s. Um, so, what do we do? I, I, I really believe that we have to just guard these liberties now. Um, and discuss them and, 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 and not take them for granted. I think what's happening now in the Philippines especially is that we're taking for granted democracy. We think that, oh well, you know, everybody thinks democracy is great, well and good. We don't need to teach them about it. We don't need to teach them the value of their vote. We don't need to teach them what democracy can do to, for them because it's just self-explanatory, right? And yet they've only had it for 30 years, like you said. I mean, they were Collins before that, and then you had Marcos, and then about 30 years ago, well, the first no, days of it. No, no, well, throughout the, the 20th century, we had democracy, and then Marcos took it away for 14 years, 
and then we had it again, right? Which is which is a, 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 a reboot, so to speak. Um, but we've never really been educated or had the, 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 the social discussion about what democracy can do for everybody. Um, it's not really taught that well in schools. It's, it's not really brought up during elections. Um, and I think that this is a discussion we need to have. You know, it was extraordinary to me after the terrible uh, attacks in Manchester how the British government was very careful to go off and, and, and talk over the media and, 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 and to assure the, the British people that the, the threat level which allows them more power and more leeway, uh, more, more liberties and more, more um, opportunity to, to curtail civil liberties, they, they were very assiduous about telling the British people that this is temporary, that you don't have to worry about it, um, that it is limited as well, right? That to me is the, the, the sign of a mature democracy, right? Um, in the Philippines, when such, such a thing happens, as has happened recently with the, 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 the Islamic terrorism attacks um, in, in the South, instead of doing that, the government has seen fit to say, well, we want to declare martial law everywhere across the country, and we don't know how long it's going to be, and this is the way forward. So, you know, we see these, these two very different reactions um, from a mature democracy and, well, uh, and a fake democracy. Um, and I, I, I was very struck by, by, by the British response because that, that, the, the response was really about guarding the, the safeguards um, against impunity, guarding the safeguards against abuse, and reassuring the, 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 the people that democracy is well and good. And I, I think that, that teaches us something, something very profound. Any, uh, you have time for another question? You mentioned towards the end of, uh, uh, of the sort of main discussion um, the rise of sort of fake news and uh, the online kind of people being able to access um, uh, news their own way um, and, and find anything, if you like, that agrees with them. I'd be curious, because that's kind of becoming a, a global uh, phenomenon. Uh, as someone who uh, sort of works in mainstream print journalism a lot, um, where maybe you see, I don't know, how, how we get out of that woods beyond just um, uh, legislating to control the internet more, whether there is, there is a way that we can, as a society, fight back against the fake news uh, that is spreading. Yeah, that's, that's a really tough one. I, I don't believe we should legislate against it because, you know, it might work well and good in a mature democracy here where people can discern what is damaging fake news and, and what is real news. But if you start to legislate against it, um, or impose it in a country like the Philippines or Turkey, for example, as we were sort of touching on earlier, then you, who, who gets to determine what is, what is irresponsible and, and what is fake and all of that, right? So I, I believe that the appropriate response is to stay the course, to call out fake news with fact when we see it, um, and to not just, fake news basically is perverted opinion. Right? couched in fake facts. And what is the antidote, the antidote for that? I don't think it should just be informed opinion. I, I think it should be going out there to see, taking pictures, talking to people. Um, you know, we're, we're, empower we're seeing empowerment of all of these dastardly um, manipulators, these propagandists, who are using the internet now um, to great effect to bring in these, these, these would-be despots. Um, we can use that, the power of the internet, to, to counteract them. We can also change the conversation. We can, we can look at, for example, one of the things I believe that we should do in the Philippines is, rather than being upset at the outrage du jour, 
and what Duterte said today and, and what, you know, the latest uh, kerfuffle um, is, I think what we should be doing is looking beyond them and, and, and looking at the young leaders who are doing a good job. We never hear anything about them. We're all, up, we're all in, a, in an uproar over what these 60-year-old, 70-year-old um, leaders who have been there for generations or for, for, for decades are doing, and we're overlooking the good things that other people are doing. Um, I think we're also dangerously ghettoizing ourselves in um, our little echo chambers, you know, we, we read The Guardian or we read The Independent or we read The New York Times because they affirm the things that we believe in and, and it's like we're being patted on the back every morning and, and thinking, well, at least someone is fighting that good fight. Um, but how do we understand the other side if we don't read them? If we don't read the Fox News, if we, if we, if we don't read The Sun, yikes, um, <laughs> read The Daily Mail. Um, Page three. Yeah, well, Breitbart. Uh, Breitbart. Or Breitbart, exactly, right? How do we understand them and how do we also try to understand where the other side is coming from? Um, because clearly the other side is um, feeling represented by these, these propagandists, by these fake news people. Um, and there are a lot of them around. There are a lot of people who read that and they're extremely popular, they have a lot of power. And, yeah. You know, particularly in a, in a democratic system. Exactly. So I think we need to get out there more, whether it's in our reading of, of the people we disagree with most, um, or get out there onto the streets to see, you know, where the, the, the attacks happened over the weekend, um, to talk to the, to, to the Muslims. Who are whole, I, I just came from uh, Baro um, to, to see. I had, it was crazy actually, I just had, I had a drink at the very pub where the attacks happened, um, two hours before the attacks, um, the, 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 um, the bower boy and the banker. And um, yeah, I think we need to go see what happens in places like that, rather than thinking them far away um, and thinking them just terrible. And we also need to talk to the Muslims who were gathered there with their picket signs saying, this is not Islam, this is not who we are. We need to have those conversations, I think. Um, because if not, we're just throwing opinions and fake news at each other, um, or throwing fact versus fiction or whatever. Um, we're, I think we're throwing we're throwing stuff. We're not gonna we're we're not going to get anywhere. Um, and maybe this is a very naive answer, because um, my real answer to this is I don't know. Uh, all I know is what I'm trying to do um, as a journalist, as a writer, as, as someone who deals with both fact and fiction on a daily basis. Um, I think the answer really is is to get out into the world bear witness and, and be quite adamant about both expressing what we're seeing and listening to what other people are feeling. So what we look forward to over the next book is a work of fiction shot through with real fact, right? Well, that's all I do, really. I mean, the Philippines is such a crazy country where you don't have to make anything up. Um, <laughs> fact is really something. stranger than fiction. Yes, it is. But, you know, it's... I'm afraid for the world, I'm afraid for the country, I'm afraid for the Philippines, and the truth is, yeah, I'm a Canadian citizen, I'm, I'm here drinking for with you guys. I could leave the Philippines. Fake champagne. Yeah, I, I could I, I, I write fiction. Yeah, well, that's right. Fictional champagne. Um, I could leave all of this behind. And we all can, I'm sure to a certain extent. But can we really? I, I, I cannot, personally. And we have to figure out a way to fix this. And we have to really ask, ask ourselves very honestly, these leaders who have led us for the past decades, how are they doing? How are, what kind of job are they doing? I think we would all agree that they're pretty absolute shit, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the world is overheating. There's, what was it, 50 of the richest individuals in the world control the equivalent wealth of the 3. 7 billion, or 3.5 billion poorest. Um, we have these, these authoritarian figures coming to power. Uh, people are dying in the streets. We're all afraid to go out. Well, how did we get there? And what do we do to fix that?
Do we just trust our leaders to do it? I, they haven't done a very good job. So I believe we should participate more. And, you know, if writing, if words are thoughts expressed or given form, then action is words given movement and given direction. And I really believe we need to get out there and we can't <coughs> leave it to the politicians to do it. Because the politicians will always, only, ever work for their own benefit. I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly the power of, of, of an election, right? We hold the politician to account. We force them to be accountable or we throw, throw them out. And maybe we should keep on doing that. At, 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 a, at a way that is... Not, oh, I hate to say more violent, but, but certainly more assertive. Because we haven't done that in the Philippines whatsoever. And I, I think we can look at the Philippines as a cautionary tale for what could happen to a lot of our other democracies that are suffering the same problems that we in the Philippines are suffering. Okay, I think also we have...